Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Metropolitan Council and our council meeting on March 9th, 2022. This is Charlie Zelli Chair. And I need to remind everyone that we're continuing our virtual meetings for the time being, like today. So uh, we will take a roll call to uh, for our items, but also if you're from the public and uh, watching this uh, meeting, we encourage you to make any comments you'd like through our uh, email at public.info at metc.state.mn.us and we'll respond promptly. Uh, so in order to uh, establish a quorum, we will now uh, ask Liz to call the roll. Council Member Barber. Here. Chambliss. Here. Cummings. Here. Fredson. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Johnson. Here. Lee. Here. Villagren. Here. Enstrom. Here. Muse. Here. Pacheco. Sterner. Vento. Wolf. Here. Zuren. Present. And Chair Zelli. I'm here. We have a quorum. Uh, and uh, First up is to approve the agenda. No vote is necessary unless anyone would like to amend the agenda, which has been set out. We have a number of business items and a uh, information item. Uh, hearing no comments, I will uh, ex uh, determine the agenda is approved, which brings us to the minutes from our meeting on February 23rd. 2022. Can I have a motion to approve the February 23rd minutes? So moved. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember uh, Lindstrom and Lee. Uh, any discussion? All right. Hearing none, Liz, please call the roll. Barber? Aye. Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Bradson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Lilligren? Aye. Enstrom? Aye. Muse? Aye. Uh, Sterner? Bento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zarin? Aye. And Chair Zelli? Aye. The minutes are approved. And now we're at, at the time that we welcome public comment. Um, we ask that people pre register, uh, and uh, no one has registered uh, for today's comment period. But if you are in the public and you would like to make comments in a future meeting, Please email us at public.info at metc.state.mn.us and uh, you can always send us comments by email. Which brings us to the consent agenda. Uh, may I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda? So moved by Gonzalez. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Councilmember Wolf. Any discussion? All right. Hearing none, Liz, please call the roll. Barber? Aye. Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hudson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Lilligren? Aye. 
Lindstrom? Aye. Mousse? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zuren? Aye. And Chair Zelly? Aye. That motion carried. On to our standing committees, and we have a report from the Community Development Committee. Council Member Lilligren. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. Uh, the Community Development Committee brings one item forward for your consideration. It is business item 2022-50. It's to approve the 2022 Livable Communities Fund Distribution Plan. As you know, each year the council develops and approves a fund distribution plan for the livable communities grant programs. In total, the funding availability recommended for 2022 livable communities account programs is $23 million. This includes $5.5 million for tax base revitalization account grants, $3.5 million for local housing incentive account grants, $9 million for livable communities demonstration account grants, $5 million for livable communities demonstration account transit oriented development grants, and $2 million for livable communities demonstration account and transit oriented development pre development grants. Changes to the program criteria and scoring guidelines reflect an uh, local housing incentive account pilot program for affordable home ownership opportunities support for affordable housing preservation programs and changes to equity criteria to clarify and to expand opportunities to achieve equity points. Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council approve the 2022 Livable Communities Fund Distribution Plan as shown in attachment one of the staff report. Thank you. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Chambliss. Thank you, Councilmember Chambliss. Any discussion? Councilmember Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually just have a question. Um, overall, um, I noticed in the, the committee notes that there were some questions and concerns raised by Metro Cities and also by Councilmember Wolf. And one of the things with these programs is it's very important that it allows for all of the cities in our region to be able to be competitive for these projects. And so I'd like to, you know, potentially either hear from um, maybe both Councilmember Lilligren and Councilmember Wolf um, just to kind of get an understanding what impact this might have on some of the programs and how it could impact some of the cities um, included in the region, including in some of the outer districts. Sure, go ahead. Uh, maybe uh, Councilmember Wolf, did you want to uh, uh, kind of elucidate and maybe Councilmember Lilligren can put some insight? I, I can do that, Mr. Chair. I had concerns about the uh, nature of some of the equity points that go into the scoring. There are things in there like uh, having DBE policies in purchasing for cities where a lot of the smaller cities in the outer parts of the metro try to shop local and don't have a DBE policy. And I think that it kind of uh, putting that into the scoring for the, the projects has nothing to do with the project itself and is trying to get cities to do something different with their other purchases, which I don't think there's anything wrong with buying local <laughs> in your, your, your local community for your supplies. Um, there's some other aspects of that as well that, that are more of a partisan nature on how the city operates rather than the project. And it concerns me that maybe we uh, lose some goodwill with the legis Oops. that we lose some goodwill with the legislature in f terms of getting authorization to increase our funding amounts and whatnot if we are putting partisan scoring into the projects. And it also has a minimum equity score. So if the cities don't do these things, they risk not being able to get funded at all, even if they're not the ones that are actually doing the project. In some of the smaller cities, the counties are doing affordable housing projects rather than the city. So I, I, I don't have any tr any problem with the overall funding plan or anything. It's with the scoring and the nature of the scoring. I think 
keeping partisan policies out of our our programs helps us have a better uh, support at the legislature because we need broad support for these programs if they're going to continue. All right, well, thank you for that comment. And I also note there is a letter from Metro Cities in the exhibit. Uh, Councilmember Lilligren, do you want to, or do you, would you like staff? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I would note that Director Barajas and Ms. Hannah Gary, who runs the program, are here as well to provide more sort of depth and detail. Um, and I appreciate Councilmember Wolf bringing the, her concerns forward. And we did, they were discussed at committee as well. I will say in general, the approach of the committee was to make this, these programs as accessible as possible. And so taking into some of the considerations of the, the different nature of communities across the metro that Council Member Wolf raises. And so there was a, a, a deliberate attempt to, um, to create accessibility for more communities. But there, as Council Member Wolf said, there is a threshold amount of equity points. And that reflects the priorities that this council has put on on equity, and so, so I, I would turn to Director Braha since so she's uh, has something to add, or I don't know if Council Member Barber wants to be a little more specific about or about the Liga or Metro Cities letter, or some specific points, or just kind of overall. For me, I think it's overall. Um, when I look at, I've had some cities that have been fairly competitive, and it's actually going through the livable communities process is a step almost for them to change their policies and, and things to align with some of these. Um, but I think pushing some of the more suburban and um, uh, even rural center cities to do it ahead of things is um, uh, counterproductive. And so I want to understand, I want to get a feeling of that is what's happening or if there's still an opportunity for, you know, a community like a Waconia or something like that, that um, is definitely part of the region, but somewhat separate from the metro, how that would work and whether a city like Chaska or Carver would still be able to compete with this sort of um, framework. So, because they've done good things and good projects um, with this program and really helped to change their communities and their policies. So I want to make sure that we're doing the best that fits because, as I've said many times, whatever policy we put in place has to work in Minneapolis and has to work in Chaska and has to work in Nord Young America. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. I really appreciate the discussion and certainly that is the core of the work that um, uh, we and Tara Beard, who wasn't able to be here today as the LCA manager and her team have been focused on is um, meeting those core statutory requirements that are both about reinvestment in the core cities and investment and uh, diversity of the housing stock within the suburban communities in the metro area. So really thinking through who will this impact? How can we make this um, accessible? What are different ways that criteria can be used and interpreted and applied um, that can that will uh, still result in competitive projects in different parts of the metro area? Um, what you see are the scoring criteria this year have been only moderately refined based on our experience and implementation in the 2021 funding cycle, which were, was a much larger uh, lift to try to simplify that process and to um, uh, kind of reduce some of the redundancies we had in scoring similar things across different areas, add clarity, um, but also uh, map the scoring criteria to the adopted policies of the council as well. Um, I know Hannah is deeply involved in that work and certainly can um, dig into some of those details in this um, if that is the will of this committee or the council at this time. Um, I would say uh, we regularly work with Metro cities in receiving their feedback and um, always are hearing from folks um, on, you know, some things that are, uh, um, elements that carry across multiple funding cycles that we are working to resolve and um, address and some things that maybe only we're hearing from one person that we need to work through in, in more detail. Um, so uh, we appreciate the comments from Metro Cities and I know that Tara had a follow-up conversation with uh, with the staff over there as well um, and provided that um, sort of written, this is what we discussed, feedback that was more of a conversation, um, but really appreciate the continued partnership partnership with Metro Cities and ensuring that broad access um, across all of the participating communities in this program, but also um, 
uh, furthering the council's adopted policies as well. Um, so I certainly, hand if there's additional detail that you'd like to add or if the council would like to, um, us to elucidate other um, I, uh, thoughts, I'm happy to do that as well. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, I can add in just a little bit more detail, um, specifically speaking from the LCDA perspective. So like Lisa had mentioned, we don't have significant changes from last year to this year because we do wait to see how those changes that we've made are impacting projects that are coming through and cities' ability to apply. Um, and we have introduced a new annual survey that we'll be doing every year so that we can get input from everyone who has applied in the previous year on their experience going through the process, um, how they feel about the scoring criteria. And at least in the LCDA accounts in this past year, we did see new suburban applications from cities that either hadn't applied in a long time or I believe had never applied, um, which is really exciting. And we did see those cities score well and end up getting funded and we're able to go through um, meet, meeting the minimum equity score. So it's definitely something that we are working with cities on and trying to make sure that um, no city is, is disadvantaged based on their geography as we come up with that scoring criteria. Okay, that's really helpful, Hannah. Thank you. Go ahead, Deb. Uh, thank you. I just want to understand, um, Council Member Wolf had alluded to that it was requiring at some points for cities to um, or counties to change policies ahead of being able to apply. Is that the case? I guess I I don't get that. I, I'm, I would like to understand that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Council Member Barber, and for cities to apply, the only policies that are required for a city to apply, which I guess it's like it's required for a disbursement of funds, not actually for application, is a fair housing policy. We don't require that cities change any of their policies and application. Um, we do publish a document called Evaluation Explanations, which gives additional um, questions that our reviewers are going to be asking themselves and examples for how cities can score points. One example of how a city can score points in um, a particular piece of the um, team capacity section is having a DBE policy, but we also look at whether or not the city is assessing disparities within their city, if the city is involved in something like GARE. So we give a range of, of options for cities to be able to achieve those points, knowing that different cities are coming to this application from different places, really trying to work with cities to, to give them opportunities to score points in different areas of our scoring criteria. So let me ask a question. So Watertown years ago had applied for a TBRA grant. Um, what would they need to do to be able to apply for that grant today? Uh, Lisa probably has to answer this one because Hannah doesn't have the history. Sorry. Uh, the <laughs> Mr. Chair, Councilmember Barber, um, you know, our application process, our, our actual application questions are different, but there isn't, especially in TBRA, isn't very much different that they would need to do. Um, the question, especially in cleanup, the cleanup questions are the same. What's the level of contamination? What do you propose to do after this? What's your cleanup plan? All of those elements go into that. Um, their, their process wouldn't look too different um, in TBRA. In the remainder of the programs, um, our goal has been to simplify the application process to make that application easier and more accessible for um, even our smaller communities that don't have a staff who only do applications um, to be, actually be able to do this as part of their everyday work. Um, and certainly the team, Hannah and the team do a lot of work to provide assistance both in the webinar and in one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, opportunities as well to help communities understand what is needed in different areas. But generally it's it's pretty straightforward and it should not um, be any uh, more, it certainly should not be more difficult than it had been in the past. Uh, I may have more questions, but pass it off to Charlie. Sure, Council Member, both hands up. Sure, Council Member Wolf, and back up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, last year, we added equity points, and you needed a minimum equity score to proceed. And this year, we added some additional equity points and raised the minimum equity score. We have not had a whole lot of opportunity to evaluate that. Our staff has been talking to the people who applied, but we haven't had time to talk to the people who didn't apply and uh, figure out how 
well that's being received by the, the region and, and whether it actually results in better projects. But as far as making those minimum equity requirements, there are points within there that are based on policies that the city has for its other business, which is the part that I'm concerned about. And it also has points about who is on the project team and other sorts of things that that could, if you're in, say, uh, Carver, if you have a local developer that's de that owns the land, wants to develop it himself using local resources, and the city doesn't have all these other policies that many of the big cities do, they would have a hard time scoring well on the the points to make the minimum equity points to be uh, considered or approved for funding. That's my concern that we haven't looked into that well enough. And we've added some of that into TBRA as well now. We have simplified the process and the from what it was, but we made some different complications that we haven't fully uh, sussed out as to whether they're working well or not. And, and that's my concern and why I, I'm going to vote no. Okay, thank you. Any? Chair, I had my what? hand up, Council Member Chambliss. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed you. Go ahead, Council Member. Oh, oh, that's okay. I just, I wanted to say that I really um, appreciate uh, the discussion that we've had regarding uh, the changes, the pilot programs, um, and, and how they're administrated and um, the points. I think that's really important as we move forward. Um, I've been involved with the Community Development Committee as a member and also um, uh, as chair of the housing work group, the discussions on um, the, the, this process of changes. And I appreciate the fact that um, it's the changes have been looked at in a comprehensive way, making sure that we have more opportunities for more cities to participate and in a way that helps us um, support thriving communities. Um, that survey is going to be great to, to make sure that we are meeting our targets and that we are expanding the opportunities that we have. And I think we can still look at, um, you know, those areas that after we've lo looked at it um, from last year, uh, this year and going forward, if there are areas for us to improve, then um, I think we have plenty of opportunity to take a look at that. But I believe that we're on the right track and that's why I'm going to vote for it. Thank you. Any other comments on this issue? Mr. Chair, this is um, Sue Vento. Hi, go ahead, Sue. Thank you. Um, I'm calling in, so that's why you don't have to look at my face today, <laughs> no. um, which is always good. But um, I, I am going to vote for the motion, but I really appreciate the issue that, that Council Member Wolf has addressed. Um, it's an issue that impacts a significant portion of the district I represent or has the potential to. And I, I really hope that going forward, we can come up with a way to do outreach with communities that, that are eligible but aren't participating and find out more about why. And I would be willing to even sit down with, with the cities and townships I represent and find out from them you know, have you considered it? Why haven't you considered it? What's holding you back? Are there things that we could do to help improve the process and the communications for you? Um, I think it's critically important. This, you know, if, if, if we want everybody to, to take on improving the region, then we've gotta, we gotta meet everybody where they're at in this region. And um, I, I think the issues, as I said, that, that Councilmember Wolf raised are, are very, very legitimate, and I'm really grateful to her for doing that, and I'm grateful to Councilmember Barber for, for um, pursuing this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this Councilmember Mousset, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, although I uh, understand the questions some of my colleagues have, I also appreciate the, you know, the intentionality here and intentionally focusing and prioritizing equity. So uh, that's why I'm voting yes uh, for this, uh, you, you know, the item. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Deb. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a final comment. Um, I don't have any disagreements with the program funding amounts. Um, I think all of that makes sense. Um, I don't know that my questions fully around how this could impact some of our smaller cities and rural centers have been completely addressed. Um, so I'm going to vote no tonight. Um, but I do fully believe in the Livable Communities Program. I think that, um, you know, if nothing else, I think Councilmember Wolf and I and our sort of opposition to this isn't an opposition to the program. It's that we also, as an organization, need to find out how to talk um, with our, our suburban and rural communities about this and, and understand the impacts to them and how the program will work across the region to help the region. And so, um, so I'll be voting no tonight, but um, at heart, I do support this program and the overall funding levels, but I hope that we can come up with better um, talking points and, and how we communicate what this program does for some of the other centers um, around the region. Great, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just jump in and say a couple of things. You know, I'm on the housing policy work group as well, of course, CDC, and constantly, I think I'm bringing up and what the things you're talking about is how do we get the suburban communities and those small cities participating? And I know on a variety of, uh, in a variety of ways, I know Tara has been doing a lot of outreach. I know my mayors have all been contacted and also we've presented at my mayor's group that meets monthly. Um, and so, you know, I know staff is very aware of trying to reach reach beyond, I think the cities that have been participating frequently and have been part of livable communities to try to encourage them and solve and meet them where they're at and train and offer whatever it is they might need if, if they do have some interest. I've seen that firsthand. I really do appreciate the comments too, because, you know, I have these very cities in my part of the region too. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to vote yes tonight, but at the same time, you know, if I've said it once, I've said it many, many, many times to our staff, how do we, how do we go beyond? And a lot of the programs we're really trying to pivot and focus on now are to do just that so that nobody's left behind and we can have more equi equitable, affordable housing uh, in areas, you know, again, outside of our central core cities. Um, so I just want to put that in the record, um, hear it loud and clear, agree with it loud and clear. And I think we'll continue to make strides in that direction. All right, thank you. We have Councilmember Gonzalez, uh, followed by Councilmember Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just briefly, a couple of thoughts that this conversation has sparked on me. Um, one thing that that I want to to um, stress is that the only way in which we can do systemic change is by doing systemic change. It's changing the system. So. We are here today because we're still operating under systems that were set up uh, in a different time for different purposes than the purposes that we're discussing today, which is have a more equitable um, housing uh, development that uh, policies that do result in, in um, equal opportunities for affordable housing for all. Um, so the, the first point that I would like us to, to always consider is if, if whatever policies the cities and the townships and the towns had in place and still haven't resulted in the kinds of um, equity outcomes that we want, if those policies are not working, then definitely this is an opportunity for them to take a look at their own houses and see where they can improve. Um, and again, the the comments that I'm hearing, I think that's exactly how this process is supposed to work. Folks don't, uh, in some of the communities that are not using to, used to this type of, of uh, scoring criteria, my struggle in doing that, and we of course can support them in understanding and seeing how they can comply with those scores. But the whole point of doing this is to improve the outcomes and, and we, the outcomes that we have are unacceptable. So if the outcomes that we have, which are unacceptable, are the result of the current policies in place, it's obvious that the policies need to change. That's again, how you do systemic change. So um, I don't think it's an either or that, that um, 
you know, we, we just can't force or, or encourage uh, folks to change their policies because it's too hard. I think we can ask them to change their policies and support them as they do that and, and provide the guidance and the technical expertise for them to successfully change any policies that they might need to change. But at the end of the day, um, we need to move forward. And what, what we've been doing, and when I say we, I mean the whole region, it hasn't worked in 160 years since Minnesota became a state. I don't think that doing the same thing is going to bring a different result. So change has to, to uh, systemic change only happens again when we do systemic change. So I, I thank you for all the, the hard work in reviewing these policies and hopefully we can have the real results that, that we all need and we want uh, in the near future. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Member Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I want to uh, echo uh, Councilmember Member Gonzalez's point. Um, in the work that, that I do in my day job in, in uh, nonprofit and anti-racism work, we, we say a system uh, uh, creates the exact outcome that it was intended to, and, and this is what we have and this is what we see and, and if we don't tackle the root problems um, head on then the system will continue to create the outcomes that it was uh, in, intended for and I, I fail to see why or what makes um, equity policies a partisan issue I, I don't think that's a partisan issue at all we, we are a regional authority and it is our uh, it is our job to uplift the whole region as a whole and so I would be voting yes right thank you uh Deb, do you have follow-up? Just a very final question. I encourage my colleagues to go drive throughout the region and look at some of our cities and small rural centers and see that some of these places don't have staff to build policies. They hire consultants to actually do their or comprehensive plans and pull together to do it because they don't have the staff for some of these things. Are those necessarily the communi communities that will qualify for liberal communities? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. But again, we have to make sure that we're building something that isn't a one size fits all and that we're looking at everything because that um, at the different needs of the different cities because I think some of those needs are very distinctly different by what kind of resources each individual community has. So. All right. Mr. Mr. Chair, this is Councilmember Vento, and I want to strongly second what Councilmember Barber just said. It, it would be really great to really go out and see those communities. Um, there's great potential there, but there's only potential if we help open the door, and I think how we approach this is really key. If only we had a bus, we could take a tour. Oh, wait a minute, we could do that. Any other comments? I thought this was a fast meeting, but I had a really robust conversation. I just really applaud this uh, the time that we've taken. And whether we're vote, you are voting yes or no, I would consider this to be an ongoing conversation. Uh, and then we have, uh, let's see, Wendy, do you have an additional comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would note that I have asked uh, in, in, in our work plan for community development, there will be more work on figuring out all of this sort of, of issue. I, I need to push back a little bit on the comments about uh, the, the nature of how these communities are from Council Member Gonzalez, because I'm talking about if a community wants to apply for funding to build affordable housing, but not, might not be able to qualify because they don't have policies like Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, it, 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 we're not talking about somebody trying to, you know, build a wall around their city and not let anybody in that they don't like. I, I, we're talking about communities that are trying to build affordable housing, but would be faced with the need to do things unrelated to the affordable housing in order to be approved for funding. Um, and one of the issues that I brought up in community development also was that these policies that we're pursuing on equity, we haven't done any research to see whether they're actually accomplishing what we want them to accomplish. We're going off of what we sort of feel like 
will make things better, but without uh, empirical research on whether it actually does work better, there can be unintended consequences. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Um, Lisa, did you wanna give us some clarifying comments here? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, council members. I just wanted to clarify um, and emphasize something that Hannah said earlier, that we don't require any policies for communities to participate. The requirements that for participation are already set in state law. That's the eligibility process that we had just gone through for re-enrollment over the last two years. Those are around uh, planning for affordable housing in your local comprehensive plan, at, you know, guiding that appropriate amount of land for doing that. Those elements in passing a local resolution, those elements are outlined in state law. That's Those are the eligible requirements. As Hannah noted earlier, we have a, a guiding or evaluation guide that shows uh, how we're thinking about um, how we score these different elements and um, in the criteria that you see in the in the business item here. Um, and the examples are provided as illustrative examples. They're not the only way that communities can receive points, but are meant to be a guide for how communities might think about it. There are certainly things that are on that are not on those lists that uh, communities could be doing that illustrate how they are meeting those um, the goals of those different areas. So I just wanted to emphasize and clarify that 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 not having a certain policy does not not make you in, ineligible to apply. Important point. Councilmember Johnson. And I think, again, hearing all of the input, I really want to um, thank Director Baraha for bringing that up because that was never my understanding that if you didn't have a Minneapolis or St. Paul or Central City policy in your own comp plan toolkit, you're out. I've never heard that. So. I think we're following state law. And then I know as our team is going out and meeting with these communities, I think we're trying to assess if they have interest in this and how we can kind of encourage them to be part of this program and where the gaps and barriers are for them. Um, because you're right, um, to Council Member Barber's point, they don't have staff that is a community development director and they don't have an HRA and they've got to hire, you know, expensive consultants. And so even to just start that can be very intimidating, but that's why we're there to try to help them with, you know, some of even the resources that we have, or I know that some of my communities have been put in touch with neighboring communities that are part of this program to find out and learn from best practices and maybe just some support that way. So it is hard for small communities, there's no doubt, but at least from, from what I've been learning, this is an effort to help extend into these communities and to not be punitive. Um, that I would never support. Um, I've railed against anything that would prohibit people from doing the right thing uh, or the things that they want to do, which are the right thing. So I'm just gonna add that as well. Um, it's a great debate, really appreciate this. I always have some very good takeaways from everybody, but you know, again, I'm going to be voting yes for this, but I'm very, very mindful of all of the good comments that have been made. Okay. Um, Lisa, do you still have your hand up from before? Or? Okay. All righty. I think we might be ready to vote. So uh, if everybody uh, feels heard, then uh, Liz, uh, you may call the roll. Arbor? No. Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Lilligren? Lindstrom? Aye. Jose? Aye. Pacheco? I'm staying. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? No. Zuren? Aye. And Chair Zelly? Aye. All right, that motion carried. Uh, on to the Environment Committee where there are no reports. There's also no reports from the Management Committee. Uh, next up is the Transportation Committee where we have two items. Councilmember Barber. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. You get to listen to me talk some more. So uh, um, and you're very thank welcome. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Business item number 2022-46 is regarding the release of the Metro E-Line recommended corridor plan for public comment. The E-Line recommended corridor plan identifies station locations for the E-Line arterial bus rapid transit corridor. A draft version of this plan was published on September 20th, 2021. Comments on the draft plan were accepted through October 31st with significant communications and outreach activities conducted during the comment period. Based on feedback received on the draft corridor plan, additional analysis of alternative platform locations was performed at several stations and changes are recommended at three stations. In addition to these changes, a summary of feedback received on the draft plan and expanded discussion of priorities for bus only lanes along the corridor are also included in the recommended corridor plan. Following the release of the recommended plan, staff will continue outreach and engagement around the plan. Staff will bring a final corridor plan for council approval following the recommended plan comment period. Upon completion and approval, the plan will identify the final plan locations for E-Line stations in advance of engineering. Discussion at the Transportation Committee included support for staff to continue engaging with and listening to stakeholder voices and a question about the feedback received on the scale of the stations. Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council authorize release to the Metro E-Line recommended corridor plan for public review and comments and direct staff to collect public comments through Friday, April 8th, 2022, summarize comments and report the findings to the Metropolitan Council. Thank you. Is there a second? Coming seconds. All right, thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Any more discussion? Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank uh, the team. Uh, I want to thank Kyle, and I know Yumi is very actively engaged in this, and I'm going to be abstaining on this tonight. I'm wearing my 50th in France executive director hat right now um, because I, I don't want there to be a conflict of interest for me in this. Um, I will just say, though, um, and I know uh, Peter on our team and, and Kyle and Yumi, you know, I had sent in uh, email, uh, comments to our team and I'm so grateful they came out and spoke with the businesses at 50th and France as part of the public input but I know my my gmail account for my work was being spammed and wasn't getting to council member Cummings and team members and then I got some other feedback actually via the mayor of Edina where there were others further south of us on France that had put comments in but they saw the numbers that had been counted for uh comments and i'm just can i just would like this team to make sure that our spam filters aren't catching people that might be emailing in about this or whatever because i mean even i had to get over onto my council email to get my you know invites and my messages through so you know we as we do outreach we we just hopefully aren't you know getting a whole bunch of people's feedback stuck in our spam uh, filters or firewalls i just want to say that that's all great well, well uh we need to check make that sh that that, that happened any other comments all right hearing none liz you may call the roll barber aye chambliss aye cummings aye Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Abstain. Lee? Aye. Lilligren? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Jose? Aye. Pacheco? I'll abstain, but I will read more and I'll be ready next meeting. <laughs> Sterner? Aye. Bento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zuren? Aye. Chair Zali? Aye. That motion carried. And uh, Cosmo Pacheco, there's, uh, I have not yet seen any uh, uh, spot quizzes or examinations. <laughs> participation is always welcome. Um, all right. Uh, Council Member Barber, another action. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, Council Members, business item number 2022-60 is about the first amendment to the updated 2040 Transportation Policy Plan to amend in the arterial bus rapid transit network, network next system and amend in the six MnDOT freight project selections as well as accepting the related public comment report for the amendment. 
Under federal law, the 2040 Transportation Policy Plan is required to identify regionally significant transportation investments that will be implemented within the timeframe of the plan and must maintain fiscal balance between anticipated project costs and projected available funding. This amendment to the 2040 TPP includes changes incorporating results of multiple arterial BRT planning projects for the E-Line, B-Line, and the results of Metro Transit's Network Next. The amendment also recognizes six projects that were awarded funding through MnDOT's Minnesota Highway Freight Program. During the public comment period, there were 56 comments from 41 commenters on the proposed amendment, with the council response shown as an attachment. 12 comments on the um, ADRT projects, 24 comments in support of one of the freight projects, Highway 212, 20 general comments on a wide variety of transportation issues. Based on these comments, one change is recommended. One of the comments letters, comment letters was from the City of Bloomington. Based on Network Next results, this amendment originally recommended removal of American Boulevard from the increased revenue scenario as an arterial BRT corridor. However, given the unique characteristics of the corridor and the City of Bloomington's commitment to fund a transitway study, the corridor will remain in the TPP increased revenue scenario as a transitway to be studied for mode and alignment. The City of Bloomington is satisfied with this change. Therefore, Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council accept the 2040 Transportation Policy Plan Amendment Number 1 Public Comment Report and adopt Amendment 1 to the 2040 Transportation Policy Plan, including re red line edits proposed by staff in response to public comment, to amends in the arterial bus rapid transit network next system, and to amend in six MnDOT freight project selections. All right, thank you. Is there a second? Second that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any discussion? I'm glad to see American Boulevard back in. Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Uh, Cousin Molly. Molly. Uh, I just wanted to comment also, I said this at transportation, but I, I really appreciate that staff worked very hard and very closely with Bloomington, the city of Bloomington, because uh, to keep this in the, um, in the, in the, as a potential uh, with the expanded revenue um, yeah, it, it shows that we partner with our communities, we take their input, we take it seriously, we look for ways to support and uh, bring people in. I think it's really, really important that we do that. They had some really important um, ideas that they brought forward and planning that they've been doing for quite some time. So it's very much appreciated by the City of Bloomington. And again, I think it reflects really positively on the work that the Council does. And uh, so thank you to the entire team for um, spending the, the time and the resources and, and the energy to uh, meet with Bloomington and address their concerns and keep them in the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments? Uh, Councilmember Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll keep it very brief. Just a thank you to all the staff. This sounds like a very simple thing that we're doing, but this is years of work. When you look at something like Network Next, this was really thoughtful planning that was put in when we knew that we had to look at the whole network and reprioritize where we were going first and how and why and where the investment was going to be the most significant and the most benefit to the region. And so this is a lot of big team effort. So a really big shout out to all of the the team of people at MTS and the contributing efforts at Metro Transit is everyone, all of the efforts very well appreciated. So that's all I have. All right, thank you. Councilmember Johnson. And yeah, just briefly to Councilmember Barber's points too. I mean, and during a pandemic, you know, so the outreach and the effort that they put in and trying to, you know, continue to plan and not be just reactionary to pandemic, but understanding where changes might be made in the future. I mean, the team just has worked so hard, I think, um, to get us where we are today. So I just want to add my thanks. Thank you. And uh, really, uh, outreach needs to be especially intentional given the pandemic and shows flexibility that we're actually listening. Great. Any other comments, thoughts? All right. Hearing none, Liz, please call the roll. Arbor? Aye. Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Lilligren? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Musay? Aye. Pacheco? 
Aye. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zuren? Aye. And Chair Zelli? Aye. That motion carried. So we're on to our final item, which is an information uh, briefing on the 2050 Regional Development Guide by the one and only Lisa Beth Baharas, this is, who's been uh, uh, timely, maybe, after our previous discussion. And I think Michael Larson is joining Lisa. So welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Members. Uh, for the record, Lisa Beth Barajas, uh, Executive Director of Community Development, um, and joined by Mike Larson, who's our Project Manager for this visioning work of the Regional Development Guide. And I would like to just offer a, a minor modification to Tara Zelli's introduction that this won't be a briefing, but more of an engagement with you uh, in this work. And uh, continue the engagement. That Don't sit back, everybody. <laughs> We're going to be engaging. <laughs> Well, I sure hope it's delightful. Uh, I know this is the work that uh, that our staff get most excited for of this, you know, thinking forward. Our planners are are always thinking about what's next and kind of segueing from your previous conversation on network next, um, thinking about all of the systems that we have in front of us in the in the. Uh, vision for the region that we want to have in 2050, adding another 10 years to our current planning cycle. So um, with that, I'll kind of kick it off and I'll be turning it over to Mike to lead the uh, discussion. So uh, next slide, please. Just some, um, oops, I'll go back one, there we go. So just some grounding, just to be sure, you're gonna see this a lot from us um, and you're gonna hear a lot from us this year um, and throughout um, the coming years as we continue um, to get deeper in this work, but to be sure that we have this continued shared understanding of why we do regional planning. And this legislative purpose was set out um, at the creation of the council, um, especially in the Land Planning Act and the importance of regional planning, really recognizing that in this region, all of our communities are interdependent, that actions that one community takes don't just live within their borders, but can impact those all around them and across the region as well. Um, and that continued growth in the region creates this need for public services. And even when this was passed in the, uh, in the early 70s, that there was increased risk of air and water pollution and water supply shortages that still live with us today, although in different forms that we need to continue to think about and plan for and um, avoid it, obviously, where we can and mitigate to the uh, best of our abilities. Those were all the uh, underpinnings for why the legislature determined that there was a need for regional planning in the seven county metro area. And so because of that, we were directed to do this um, and ensure the coordinated orderly and economical development of the region and at that base of protecting public health, safety, and welfare, which all of our governments have in the state of Minnesota as at the core of their work. Um, different from other local governments, however, is that we have um, a very narrowly defined set of actions we can take and authorities that we have to further that within our work. Um, next slide, please. So um, building off of that, the statute does require that the council create a development guide that, we're off, that we are to prepare and adopt this a comprehensive development guide for the metro area. Um, and next slide, please. And that that guide should really focus on, um, or really at its base is, is prescribing these guides for how development and where development will, will occur within the region. So that is the base of this work. This isn't all of the requirements of our work, but really this is the foundation of why we are doing this work and what we're meant to cover in our um, Metropolitan Development Guide. And I will just say at the start here, sometimes you will hear me or our staff say Metropolitan Development Guide or Comprehensive Development Guide or Regional Development Guide. And it's not because we're confused, it's because actually the statute says all three things and, refer and it all means the same thing. So I just wanted to make that point of clarification up front just to be sure. Um, I try to keep it the same word, but in case I trip and say something else, that's what we mean. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is also uh, the words that are in that bolded blue on the bottom of the slide here, that really that we should be thinking about in this work, all of those future developments that will have an impact on the entire region. And that includes all of these things, land use, parks, <clears throat> 
excuse me, airports, highways, transit, and it's not limited to these things either. Um, so really thinking about this as the core of our work and what we're trying to accomplish and what the uh, purpose of the development guide is. Next slide, please. Um, as I had noted uh, previously, these aren't all of the requirements. Um, we are also, you know, we have additional requirements related to how we um, do our regional parks and trails planning, how we do our uh, wastewater planning, how we do our transportation and transit planning that come both from state statute and from federal rules, and even how we do water supply planning in the region. And we'll get into that in more detail as we dig deeper into some of those areas. But today we're going to stay at that higher level vision level. Um, so as I know our staff have said before, in any sort of planning process, whether it's a strategic plan or a comprehensive plan, we always start with the where are we today, then where do we want to go, and then how do we want to get there. So you've been hearing from staff over the last almost I think two years on report outs on um, where are we today, so that comprehensive uh, comp plan composite reports that even just at our last meeting last week on local plan priorities, those are meant to build that foundation on where we are today. Um, we've also had developers panels, we've talked about COVID impacts, and we've had a number of other things. And certainly if we've missed something about where we are today um, that you would like us to report back on, investigate and report back on, we're happy to do that as well. Um, then we're going to be turning to where do we want to go, and that's part of uh, really a lot of the work that we'll be doing in this year and um, moving into the coming year, and that policy development is how do we want to get there. Uh, next slide, please. And I will turn this over then to Mike Larson to lead the remainder of this conversation. Thank you. Michael, you may be muted. I'm not uh, hearing. My apologies. No problem. <laughs> I clicked the, mute, uh, clicked the mute button. Thank you, Lisa, for that intro. Uh, and good afternoon, council members. Uh, uh, my name is Michael Larson. I'm planning analyst in the local planning assistance group and community development. Uh, and I'm in the project manager for the uh, uh, values and vision process for the regional development guide. So as we introduce this work to you, um, I will share some of our uh, some of our thoughts on why we would want a regional vision. Uh, I'll also share some observations that staff have had about the effectiveness of the vision that's currently defined in Thrive MSP 2040. Uh, as part of preparation for engaging you on this work, we've we've done an uh, inventory of recent council and advisory group meetings. Uh, uh, and we'll share that information with you that generally affirm uh, kind of our general our understanding of the kinds of issues that um, have been important to you recently. Uh, and finally, we will uh, talk about uh, some next steps with you and ask for your feedback around that, uh, including uh, additional uh, internal and ex uh, external engagement ideas. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about. Um, the qualities uh, of a, a good vision. Uh, vision statement really is about achieving consensus around what our desired uh, future uh, should look like and having uh, some written language to, to describe that. Uh, I think we've all seen vision statements where that we find particularly inspirational, uh, or maybe on the other hand, uh, vision statements that might seem uh, naive or vague or perhaps unrealistic. Uh, I would argue that a good uh, vision statement uh, uh, will both inspire and be clear, uh, considering um, that the region, that our region does have challenges and problems. It should be evident why we are, think there are problems and that we're taking them seriously uh, and that we're rising to the challenge. Uh, and as we do have opportunities and strengths in our region, not just challenges, it should be also clear that we will embrace them for full and positive effect for the region's residents. Um, and finally, the, the vision um, is intended to, uh, for our purposes, set the general direction for the council's plan and policy development, uh, which, which in turn uh, directs us how we should conduct our business. Uh, next slide, please. So a vision set, a uh, vision statement or vision uh, a set of statements should help us set the tone and general direction for plan development. 
Having said that, I also want to say that we don't envision a completely linear process where the vision is first set in stone and then that directs everything that follows. We have been asking staff and different technical work units about their thoughts about the region's vision. Um, staff work to implement policy and have a wealth of wisdom and experience that uh, to share with us um, going forward. And as we work through future plan and policy development, there may be opportunities uh, for us to improve uh, and refine the clarity of our overall vision, including its uh, consistency with the language that is developed uh, in forthcoming policy and system plans. Next slide, please. Now I want to talk about how our current um, regional development guide describes uh, the vision for the region. So this this language is a uh, intro language that occurs in Thrive. That the Metropolitan Council has listened to the aspirations voiced by the region's residents, civic, nonprofit, profit, and business leaders, and government and officials, and woven their thoughts and hopes into five desired outcomes that define our shared regional vision. Uh, next slide, please. So I think you should be familiar with these terms, thrive, introduced, or strengthened. Uh, these concepts around the five outcomes of stewardship, prosperity, equity, livability, and sustainability. Um, thrive really addresses these issues seriously and discusses their just different dimensions in pretty great detail. Uh, there's considerable thought uh, to how these different outcomes manifest themselves and how they are interrelated with each other. Next slide, please. So having said that, I want to share some ideas from staff about their reflections and experience uh, on the Thrive Outcomes and their work. Um, for many of us, these five outcomes seem at times more like principles or values than outcomes. Uh, it doesn't work very well as a coherent vision for the region. Uh, this, this particular section of Thrive is quite long. It's 50 pages. Uh, the text is very dense often with long lists of ideas and uh, contextual information. Uh, stewardship, for example, is a great value, but it's very broad and could apply to many different things. Uh, stewardship of a capital asset like a train is very different than stewardship of the environment. Um, while Thrive does address this, um, did the different dimensions of stewardship, it can be kind of clumsy to talk about this as a specific vision or, or outcome. Um, equity, obviously very important to the region. Um, equity can be considered to be a value uh, rather than a vision. Uh, I think we could use equity in many different ways. If it is a value, uh, it presents a need to define what our vision for equitable outcomes would be. Um, while Thrive does discuss the different dimensions of equity, it doesn't do so in a very clear or concise way. Uh, an equitable future, for example, might be one where we would uh, significantly reduce or eliminate racial income and wealth gaps. Um, the value of equity could also conduct, could also guide how we conduct our processes, ensuring that we develop relationships with different communities and engage them in the most appropriate and effective ways. Uh, when we also when we talk about the value of equity. We could start to use um, other language, uh, other complementary language uh, like fairness, compassion, or justice. So that's maybe something to consider. Another example, livability, could be considered an outcome. However, it is a very broad concept uh, and it really means different things to different people. It's probably the hardest to define. Um, the text, for example, discusses many different things, uh, ranging from the burden of student debt, complete streets, parks, park and rides, and housing preferences of different demographic groups. So it's a bundle of information uh, in that particular outcome. Um, finally, um, having gone through some reflection and critique of Thrive, um, a common theme under discussions that when we are finished with this process, uh, we would expect to see a lot of these things, uh, many if not most of these ideas uh, reflected, uh, reorganized, rearticulated in ways that will be more helpful for planning and implementation and easier for staff to implement. Next slide, please. So again, when we think about vision, we should also think about how we're ultimately uh, going to use it and how it will guide us. On this, on this particular slide, you see a list of terms. 
um, that follow from the vision in terms of a planning and implementation process. They're not, they have not been used consistently across our plans and we are working to develop some shared definitions of them going forward. So the plans talk the same language and can look back towards the vision. Um, so these terms, you know, the language that you see here may be tweaked uh, and defined a little bit going forward. So maybe this may look a little bit different depending on, on where things land. Um, you may, uh, may be familiar with the term progressive elaboration. Uh, basically, uh, it means that we further articulate things as the work requires uh, and uh, as we under something, understand something better or in more detail. And so um, our, our goal is for the vision and values to be as succinct and brief as possible or as long as it needs to be. Um, it should really be clear about how at the end of the day, it should be clear about how the vision translates into our regional development guide and our system and policy plans uh, and our measures at the, um, the measures that we identify uh, uh, to evaluate our work should tell us if we're being successful uh, and if not uh, reevaluate or redirect uh, redirect our efforts uh, upstream. Uh, next slide, please. There you go. Very good. So uh, last week at the Community of the Whole, you heard a synopsis of local plan priorities. Uh, another foundational uh, piece of input into our vision process uh, has been to understand how recent conversations uh, have occurred in various committee and advisory group meetings um, that may reflect your overall interest and in priorities. Uh, Gabby Olvera and local planning assistance listened to 56 archive meetings of the committees that you see on the screen, uh, including each of the council committee meetings and all of the council's advisory bodies. Next slide, please. So uh, Gabby coded uh, comments uh, from each of these committee meetings and advisory group meetings around the 10 exploratory issues that we originally def uh, defined for the 2050 Regional Development Guide process. And those 10 exploratory issues are on the screen right now. Um, you know, to get into a little more detail, uh, members of the committees and groups discuss, for example, the affordability of housing and transit, how climate change might be uh, help mitigated through various projects that might, we might do, ensuring that communities are involved in decision-making pro uh, processes, particularly how the um, projects that uh, those we impact or could benefit from the most, um, how infrastructure projects could uplift uh, marginalized communities, how disparities exacerbated by the pandemic can be addressed, uh, ensuring that the regional park system is accessible and contributes to public health. Um, how regional policies can be designed to fit uh, and be flexible, uh, considering a local context. Uh, how ideas of shared prosperity can be better articulated. Uh, how the experience of, uh, for example, of immigrant farming communities might teach us something about land stewardship. Uh, and how racial bias and safety concerns affect people's experience on the transit system. Next slide, please. Okay, this graph shows the distribution uh, of frequency of comments by issue. Uh, the bar, the blue bars represent the percentage of comments among the various council meetings, uh, council and council committee meetings, well, the green bars show the distribution of comments by advisory groups as a whole. Uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, you know, please keep in mind that the, obviously the comments and discussion naturally follow uh, from the agendas. Uh, however, uh, I think there are some interesting things to note. Uh, not surprisingly, equity remains a top discussion item, uh, accounting for a significant percentage of the comments for both council and advisory group meetings. TAB and uh, uh, the equity, uh, the Transportation Advisory Board and the Equity Advisory Committee uh, discuss equity the most at their meetings, followed by uh, the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission. Uh, infrastructure is a top, uh, top discussion item among advisory groups, and not surprisingly, TAB accounts for slightly more uh, than half of those comments. And obviously, you know, again, this is not terribly surprising uh, given the nature of those meetings. Uh, from a staffer perspective, I have a couple of reactions to this information for your consideration. 
a few of those, a few of the issues, uh, the exploratory issues that we had identified uh, received less attention that we might, than we might expect. Um, those include climate change and pandemic recovery. Uh, lower representation of those issues in your discussion um, could represent a need to better highlight or integrate uh, these topics into uh, forthcoming agendas. Uh, perhaps adding opportunities for greater specificity or clarity around the planning issues. Um, so I, I will welcome, um, when, we're, when it's appropriate to pause, I will welcome your thoughts on whether this might be the case. But I have a couple more slides um, on, uh, on this evaluation, this meeting evaluation. So next slide, please, Greg. So um, the, um, you know, there were obviously issues are connected to one another and the more obvious uh, connections uh, between the issues uh, were equity and its relationship to affordability infrastructure and weather uh, and welcoming and safe communities. Climate, uh, when it was discussed, uh, was often uh, discussed in conjunction with equity and public health issues uh, and the uh, uh, issues of uh, resilience and stewardship um, uh, concepts around climate. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, here are some additional thoughts that we had for the memo in addition to the 10 exploratory issues, just staff noticed the frequency of, uh, you know, uh, comments related to the, the value of communication, the importance of collaboration, uh, community engagement and understanding communities as we work with them. And so we wanted to, uh, you know, we want to reemphasize and um, show that back to you. Uh, next slide, please. So we will be developing uh, a public engagement. We're in the process of developing a public engagement plan with the support of communication staff uh, based on the principles of the council's overall public engagement plan. And some of those uh, in principles include uh, ensuring a range and diversity of voices, uh, using eng engagement to reinforce or develop new trusting relationships with stakeholders and communities, ensuring that all suggestions for input are considered, uh, including documentation on how we incorporate or do not incorporate suggestions, and then also circling back to participants to discuss how we did or did not include them. Uh, utilizing existing groups and forums, such as the advisory groups, to solicit input and to generate dialogue. Um, and we have uh, a few of those meetings uh, set up already. Um, we want to integrate this engagement effort uh, with other engagement efforts related to the development of the regional development guide and with consideration how system and policy plans will, will ultimately um, uh, engage their stakeholders. Uh, we, we fully expect that there may be stakeholders who aren't very interested in a visioning process, but maybe in, more interested in, in the details of the policy and plan development, and that's something we will uh, articulate. Uh, document. Uh, one, I think, very exciting um, idea that we're kind of putting together and exploring is to the formation of a youth cohort for uh, this and other engagement efforts. Um, our idea is to solicit the input of uh, residents in the region that may be in their teens to early 20s. Uh, the idea is to identify um, uh, a, a group that will Demogra demographically represent the, the future uh, and who maybe by 2050 may be at some midpoint in their career and have had families. So uh, supporting uh, engagement uh, of those uh, young people uh, and, and uh, investing them in the future uh, in terms of the, the plan development. Uh, and my col uh, co colleague Darcy Vander in, in research uh, is ex has extensive experience working on this type of thing and is assisting with this, uh, on this effort. Um, we've provided you with foundational materials to kind of prepare you for the planning process and particularly uh, the comp plan composite work um, from local comprehensive Comprehensive plans. Oh, not yet. Go back, please. So the comp plan composite uh, information is a significant source of input. That local wisdom is something that we want to consider uh, for the regional uh, next regional development guide. Uh, next step in terms of foundational per, uh, materials for this discussion is um, as a inventory of our region's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We think the region, region uh, the vision, uh, the vision statement, the values should be grounded uh, in that understanding. 
um, so that the plan addresses known issues and opportunities. Um, we will also provide um, summary information about how existing um, vision statements and values, um, how we might, uh, whether those could influence our work or, or could be considered uh, as we draft as we draft language. Um, finally, we've got um, sessions lined up throughout the balance of the year, at committee of the whole meetings uh, to engage you and on this and other aspects of the 2050 regional development guide, and we'll continue to solicit input from subject matter experts who uh, implement our policy plans and our staff working groups. Um, next slide, please. So um, as we be, begin to structure our engagement and um, consider the, what might be the final outcome or product from this process, um, here's kind of some of the high level questions we're asking ourselves and others. Um, you know, what are the region's values and how do they relate to the council's uh, influence? And by influence, I mean authority, operations, grants, that kind of thing. How do they work? How do they relate to the work of our partners? Um, uh, what What is the um, region's vision and how do our values inform that vision? What's the connection? Um, how should the language be organized and how much detail is needed? Um, and with, a, with due consideration of how this will impact policy development. And, um, you know, uh, with an understanding, again, that everything's related to everything else, what are the key interrelationships among the issues? Uh, a lot of that is discussed and thrive, but can we, can we provide kind of, um, can we simplify that in a way that's more useful for, uh, say, uh, policy refinement or program development? And what are the highlight, high level outcomes we want to achieve um, for, for the region? Um, so I fully expect we will get a lot of input, hopefully in a way that um, re-energizes people about our region's challenges and opportunities. We want to make sure that, you know, all of the input that we get finds a home in our process. Um, and, you know, if not in the vision, then, then maybe somewhere else um, and use it as a way to strengthen our relationships and our work. So it's, you know, not just the words on the page, but um, how we align our work together. Uh, how we support one another. I imagine um, some stakeholders may have very specific ideas and detailed suggestions, maybe too much detail that to live in a in a in a regional vision, but could be reflected again, you know, in some some other part of the plan. Um, so that um, next slide. That's what we have for you today, and I uh, would love to hear your thoughts about that overview and. Um, especially in ways uh, that we can engage you the most effectively during this process, what your needs and interests are and in what form and format would be most useful to provide uh, concrete uh, ideas and suggestions and, and dialogue around, around that. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Lisa. And this is really exciting. And I know we're talking about really initiating the whole process, but this is so beautifully laid out and uh, I really appreciate that. Um, let's get some comments and reactions. Uh, Reva, you have your hand up. I mute myself. Yes, um, thank you for this presentation. It's really nice to be able to look at this 2050 regional guide in terms of the approach from the very start. Uh, 2050 uh, seems like a long time away, but some of these things have to get started now in order for us to accomplish our vision. So what what we're doing with these uh, guides and this uh, advanced planning is so critical in how we approach it and how we lay the foundation. And I'm really glad to see um, how the Metropolitan Council is approaching this guide. I'm sure that there were best practices along the way that are going to be applied to the 2050 guide. And I really like the fact that you've outlined the vision process, the qualities and how the values um, can shape um, our, and influence um, decisions that are made and our policy. So um, well done. I'm looking forward to uh, taking the year that's left of my current term um, into this process. So thank you so much. Great. Right, thank you. Molly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Lisa and Michael, for this presentation. It's just great. It's really exciting. It's uh, it, it does get one pumped up thinking about uh, what's coming next. So that's very good. I have a, a 
comment and then a question. I really, really, really like the uh, cohort of youth and young adults. I think that's absolutely critical. I mean, it is their future that we are planning and thinking and, and uh, talking about. So I think that's really important also. Whenever we bring youth into the conversation, uh, you know, they're they're they don't have the same old same old kind of mentality that just kind of keeps things going. Well, this is the way we've always done it. But they come in with creativity and with enthusiasm and with great ideas, and um, uh, so I'm really really excited about that. Um, and then um, my question, and I don't know if this is the proper place to raise it, but I, I'll, I'm gonna bring it up. So in a lot of this, we, we talk about the EAC and the EAC involvement. And, and you know, recently we've had a presentation from the EAC and there were um, frustrations expressed in ways that we could more fully engage and more usefully uh, apply what they bring. I think it is critical that we uh, find ways to work more cooperatively and satisfy some of the the needs and the questions that they brought up their presentation a couple of months ago. So I think that some of their issues were going to be referred to maybe the management committee for further conversation, but I'm sort of curious as to, or I'm, I'm hoping, I guess, that we will get an update into what sort of resolution, if there was one, or how what how their concerns were addressed by the council and how we might involve them more uh, deeply. I think that's a really, really important um, uh, part of all of the planning that we do is what they what the EAC brings to all of our planning. So um, I hope that we can get an update on what they're doing and uh, how we're addressing. And then again, this is a great presentation. I'm really excited about what you're doing and look forward to how we might all participate. Thank you. Great, and uh, while well, we have that thought, thanks, Molly. Uh, Mike, did you want to respond today? Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Three strikes, uh, we're going to throw you out of the meeting, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Cummings. I would, I would like to respond. Um, we are, I, you know, I, would, I think many of us did watch that meeting and reviewed the materials and, and heard the critique. Um, we, although we are developing and have not yet finished a public engagement plan, um, we are engaging, um, we'll be engaging um, our advisory bodies um, in, diff in, in different ways and we will identify that. We do have a few meetings set up and we do, we are on the agenda for the EAC in April. So we will be having a similar presentation. I, um, you know, uh, I think we've heard that they want to be engaged uh, early and they, um, you know, we want to give them perhaps some homework in advance and keep the presentation a bit tighter than it was today. Um, so that there's more time for discussion. Um, uh, we, uh, I think all staff, I can speak for all staff that we are all, uh, um, you know, consider equity to be an important regional planning issue and, um, our process includes our own internal equity task force, um, and there will be through our uh, stakeholder analysis, um, uh, we would identify um, stakeholder groups um, uh, that most are directly impacted by our, equ our equity issues in the region and needs. And so um, that's something that we can, um, you know, I should also mention that EAC members have been part of our scenario planning. Uh, workshops and so we're thinking about modeling that a uh, process um, for the vision. Um, so uh, we will ask like, um, uh, you know, def deferring to the values and, and approaches in the council's public engagement plan, we will ask them how they want to be engaged and what the most effective way to engage them over time is rather than presume. Right. Uh, Robert. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Lisa and Michael, for your work and to your teams as well. This is really exciting. Uh, it was listening, interesting listening to Council Commander Cummings say how excited she gets about this. And I think it takes a particular type of person to be excited by planning out 20, 30 years, and, and I find it really exciting as well. And Michael, just on your last point, and this, um, 
I really appreciate uh, how you're thinking about engaging the advisory groups and specifically the equity advisory com committee and the kind of framework you just presented to us really reflects their comments, right? They were, they're looking to kind of get into the discussion and the substantive part. And so sort of designing in a way where we can give them information in advance, sort of trim down the presentation part to let them use their time together, to support them using their time together to really grapple with the issues, whether that's the equity advisory committee or any of the advisory groups, I think that's a great approach. Um, I really also appreciate your um, your comments about sort of the outcomes and the staff perspective on the outcomes and how they were uh, sort of framed in ways that seem more like values or something and that that makes them difficult to difficult as outcomes to work toward. So I just think that's really insightful and that's good for us to hear. So I look to I'm interested in seeing how that kind of plays out and 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 you said this um staff person's name a few times and i'm sorry i just didn't get it but the one who audited the meetings and collected the discussion emphasis data i just I, so thank her that's amazing <laughs> but also uh i just find that kind of data really useful and so i don't know if that's a a practice that we tend to um, employ going forward, but just just seeing that you know, as policymakers, of course, we're always data people, trying to look at ways of comparing disparate things, and I, I just found that really helpful, and I could see how much work that um, that it really is. In the other piece, and and I just don't remember this before, and maybe it is in the current, in the 2040 plan, but this idea of issue connections. And I just I think that's a great approach, and I look forward to you know seeing if that kind of grows into a more even more robust way. And you know what I was talking about breaking down silos or or whatever. But if we're doing it at the fundamental planning step, and we're looking for these connections, these intersections, you know I just think it'll help um, our work. It'll support the progress within the region so well. So I look forward to seeing how that uh, plays out. Thank you for your work. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Great comments. You know, building on that, uh, Lisa and Michael, I love your lessons learned early in the presentation and realizing that to actually get greater clarity and actually distill the thoughts into true vision, that actually takes more work. I mean, you know, like I didn't have a time to write a short one, so I wrote a lot. I mean, I didn't, I mean, it It will actually is a really insightful uh, observation that uh, there's a lot of reflection, but less like, okay, here's really the focus areas. Here's kind of, and and I think that it is a, uh, it, it may be a challenge given the breadth of our engagement, but also to bring that to a point where it's it'll be meaningful is is a is a good track to be on. Other thoughts, reactions. Mr. Chair, if I may add on to that, yeah. um, n not only does that help us as you know staff responsible for the implementation on a day-to-day -day basis, but also to report back to you on what are we doing and to report back to the public, and and for our um, uh, for all members of the region to be able to say this is what they're doing. They can see it easily. Um, easy to find. It makes it a much more accessible document. So while, you know, we might have brought our own personal um, experiences to it, we do see a lot of value in uh, across the region and all of our work um, in in um, having much more clarity in, in what that vision is and what we're trying to accomplish. But as you point out, more, um, more accessible makes it more um, impactful. <laughs> Anyone else? Count, I'll count to three. Um, as I think you've said, this is a start. Uh, it's really helpful to see the kind of next steps. We'll have more opportunities in various places to provide our own inputs and reactions along the way. Um, please call on us, and I think uh, uh, I'm kind of, I appreciate Council Member Lilligan saying, boy, this really could tell people who got really resonated 
I'm one of those people too, so I think it's fun. Yeah. Uh, all right, last chance. Well, Mr. Any... Chair, if I yeah, may, please may I um. Uh, we did uh, indicate that we would um, be engaging with you through primarily Committee of the Whole. Certainly, if there are other places you would like us to be and to be yeah. engaging with you in different ways, we would love that feedback. This is how we're starting, so we don't have to end here either. You might say in a couple of months, you know, maybe we need to do this differently. Um, so this won't be the last time we ask. We'll keep asking, is this the way you want to be engaged or is there a different way that you would prefer? Um, and that can always change. And I would also offer um, on the slide that uh, Mike had shared with um, questions for consideration as we're thinking about developing that, I would offer that those are seeds that we're planting with you today. We're gonna keep asking those questions of you. Um, we're going to be sharing what we're hearing with our partners and our advisory group members and feedback from the region on that too, as we continue to further refine and articulate what that vision is for the region. So. Be thinking about that. I, I ask for you to be, you know, as you're sitting there drinking your coffee in the morning, what should what should our values be? Um, be thinking about that, and and certainly um, we'll be coming back to you and asking you not once or twice, but the, many times throughout the year. Well, and I'd also offer uh, as ambassadors for, of the Met Council to the region, uh, we all have opportunities to speak to different groups. We attend various other city council meetings, other chambers, interactions. I know I do. And it really be helpful for us to be asking that question and kind of represent that here's what here's the things we'd love to hear and maybe give a sense to a larger region of the role we're playing. So Councilman Lindstrom. Now you're muted. All right. Uh, just on this point, I presented to a class uh, of young people, uh, 20 year olds last week, and it was the end of a very long class, maybe a three hour long class. And I was the last speaker. It was like 830 at night and they were so engaged. It was really positive uh, thinking about this perspective youth cohort. Um, I think I'll I'll second that or or uh, reiterate the importance of that. Um, just this one experience, I, I felt like I was before a, a, one of those legislative committees that you find yourself in front of from time to time, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Here's that. That's, they might have been a little bit nicer. More, <laughs> yeah, they might have been a little bit more forgiving, but uh, great questions and lots of engagement. Great, great. Well, that's a perfect example. Thank you. Well, we're going to have more chances to talk about it. Committee of the whole, we'll think about other areas. Uh, but uh, again, Lisa, uh, Mike, thank you so much for uh, sharing that today. Uh, do uh, is any other uh, uh, reports that anyone would like to share since we're together? Uh, Peter, go ahead. Just real quick, uh, we had a report at the Environment Committee yesterday about our wastewater surveillance, which some of you may have uh, seen some articles in the paper about that. It's fascinating. We've got a web page that's dedicated to our wastewater surveillance. You recall that we have a great partnership with the University of Minnesota on this, and it's showing the viral loads in our wastewater uh compared to the um uh covid positive tests and it's interesting to see the uh viral loads peak about a week before you see the uh the covid positive test peak what's even more interesting is that on any given month our met council homepage gets a I'm told about 10,000 hits. And this one page, this wastewater surveillance page last month, I think the number was over 16,000 hits wow. on that page alone. So uh, folks are really dialed into this. Uh, the general public is very dialed into it. We've got great partnerships, as I mentioned, with the university that's super interested. 
and then of course we're we're uh, communicating with the department the department of public health and other public health folks on a very very regular basis on this too so it's it's not just interesting data uh, but it's um i, I believe tur turning into really uh, actionable um uh, data that that folks are using out there in the real world. Thank you for pointing that out, Peter. I uh, also have been attending a lot of the governor's uh, uh, forum to uh, have some lessons learned about the pandemic, the state's response, various agencies' roles, um, and uh, you know how we would, as a state, continue to uh, uh, you know monitor and to be prepared. And uh, it was really gratifying to see the Department of Health and others really now what was kind of a cool thing. Now it's kind of an integral kind of early warning system that we are now part of that is built into this kind of future kind of, uh, 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 you know, uh, reliability and responsiveness. Molly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just just furthering that a little bit more in, in our um, meeting this month with the city of Bloomington, my meeting, their interagency meeting, uh, they too were blown away by the information that was available. And then they had a number of other questions about what other um, things uh, might be able to be detected and if it could be geographically specific for our planning purposes and things. They had all kinds of questions, which I had forwarded to Lisa Thompson. Um, and she passed it on as well to Steve below and, and he gave the most detailed, informative, incredible response to every one of their questions and then a little bit beyond. And then Lisa also commented even further. So, um, you know, it, it's such valuable information and it's being used by our communities in, in many interesting and and thorough ways that maybe we haven't even thought about that they're able to use and apply in their specific circumstances. But again, to ES, it's just, um, it's, they're so good. I mean, the reply, I got a reply like within 24 hours and it was detailed and it was thorough and I was able to pass it on. And, and that is a lot to do, especially in these times where everyone is pulled, uh, stretched to the max so i really appreciate that and it's um it's quite an effort and and the information is is so valued so i just thank staff for that as well well lisa you've trained us well uh we're not in the wastewater business we're in the clean where we produce clean water business i got that but turns out we're also in some of these other areas so congratulations you you, you maybe have a few words i do if that's okay chair Zelli. um we are in the business of protecting public health and being an early alarm system can clearly be a part of that. And it's a, a paradigm shift for sure <laughs> for us to be thinking about that. We've heard from uh, inquiries similar to, to uh, what Molly was referring to uh, about that granularity and specific to um, smaller regional sections or cities or communities. And uh, we're open to that. If this is a service that there's a value that the region wants us to continue, we absolutely would set ourselves up on a more, um, I mean, we, this was a stretch for us to get the technology because it's a very different testing and, and process than what we normally have done. But we have the folks with the mind power and the motivation and the interest to serve a purpose like this and a willingness to partner with others. And I, I really emphasize that, you know, if we thought we had to do it all on our own, we wouldn't be where we are today. And so it was cultivating that relationship with the youth and their capabilities and saying, together we can do something better. And so let's figure this out. And, you know, those are the, those are the kinds of stories that get me excited to come to work every day. It's the, inspiration of seeing a small group of people really do something pretty uh, significant and cool. So we're gonna we're gonna test the waters with our communities this spring and we go out and do our budget briefings. We'll probably tie it in with that or it might be a separate one, but we'll we'll find out what their interest is. And of course we're also keeping an eye on the value in terms of where we end up with um, you know we're not endemic yet. Everybody's hoping we will be soon, but you know, some of it is is the rest of the story as COVID unfolds. Exactly. Well, great. Thank you. And 
please extend to your whole team our appreciation. Mr. Chair? Um, yes. This, this is Sue Vento. If it would be possible for us to all get a copy of the response that Steve provided for um, for um, Council Member Cummings' request, I'd appreciate it because um, I'm going out to speak to um, some city councils in the not too distant future, and I'd love to have that information along in case they want to engage in some more conversation about it. Chair Zelli, if I could suggest, yeah. I think we can take that information, but also add this extra, this new piece about exploring the possibility of taking that service another step forward and maintaining it as well. So we'll, we'll package that together and get that out to you. That'd be great. Thank you. Perfect. Anyone else uh, have a report? Uh, Mary Bogey, Regional Administrator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just one quick note from me, and that is that it's my honor to publicly congratulate our general counsel. Anne Bloodheart is the recipient of an award as the in-house counsel of the year in the category of nonprofit and government. Sure. Um, this award is given by a Minnesota lawyer, and she was nominated by um, the Lockridge Grindle now in law firm. So congratulations, and well-deserved. Congratulations, Ann. Wonderful. Congratulations. And I was going to ask you for a report, but we want an acceptance speech. And how'd you do it? <laughs> we know how you did it. Well, I mean, I, I'm really appreciative of the award, but I, I really think it's just a reflection of all of the good work that my team does all of the time and the good work that the council does. Um, but it is nice to be recognized um, when you're in the public sector because we do. We do work really hard and I do actually have a report this week other than my award. Um, we talked last year sometime about the Just Deeds project, which is a project to remove restrictive racial covenants from properties throughout the metropolitan region. And um, most of the attorneys on my staff are volunteering with it. And we had completed our training. We didn't have a chance yet to take on any particular work. Um, in the meantime, last week, Hillary Loveless, who is um, in our livable communities unit, discovered that five of the council properties are listed in the Just Deeds database and had restrictive covenants on them. So the day we found out, one of my attorneys, Darcy Erickson, drafted all of the paperwork and packaged it all together so that we can get those covenants removed from our properties. And now we'll be working with um, the Livable Communities Unit and our real estate office to make sure that none of the other council houses that we have or any of the ones that we're purchasing um, also have those restrictive covenants on them. So just a, a step that we're taking that we think is consistent with this council and it's just the right thing to do. So happy to announce we were able to get that done. That's great. And Wonderful. That's all hey, well, congratulations on both your honor, but also uh, that was that's nice to hear as a follow up. Any other news for anybody? All right. Well, we're uh, got a few extra minutes. The sun's still up, so um, enjoy the day. Great meeting, great conversation. Uh, I mean, discussion. And um, this meeting's adjourned. We will see you all soon. Thank